Communications Director and Curator here at the Donkey Mill Arts Center. And um, this talk obviously is held in conjunction with our amazing exhibition, Namala, Laird Landscapes of Kona Coffee Heritage. Um, it will be up at the mill, most of you folks know, up until December 12th. So if you, I don't know, most of the artists have come through, but um, we'll be scheduled playing some short um, filming with certain artists who, if you're interested in filming and we can um, share short videos about your piece, about your process to share on our social media, we'll be doing that as well. Um, so, oh wait, Mio, you were gonna do some of the housekeeping, sorry, before I dive too far. In. I feel like everybody seems quite acquainted with the Zoom and I yeah. just wanted to say that we are recording, as you know, yes. and that we will be um, doing sort of five minute presentations um, and it's alphabetical order and um, people can <clears throat> type in the chat and ask questions and I'll go ahead and recite them. Um, but we will be keeping track of time because we have a lot of artists um, and we have about an hour and a half. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful, yeah. it's so nice to have you all here. It really is, it really is. And just for the record, this is our first online artist exhibit walkthrough. So it's it's fun to use this technology to connect ourselves as well. So so uh, I know I'm not supposed to apologize in advance for technical difficulties, but but I will. No, no, no. We're all good. We're in good hands. Um, so just to give a little back of background on the exhibition, um, Namala Laird Landscapes of Kona Coffee Heritage. Um, it really started, I mean, the seed that was planted was every year we do an exhibition that's all about, um, that celebrates Kona coffee heritage um, associated with the Kona coffee um, cultural festival. So this year with plans changing and um, the festival being postponed, it was, I saw it as an opportunity to really step back and look at the larger picture of of our aina, of our land in Kona, and, and really the abundance of it, um, that we can celebrate all of the, the many elements that really come together to create our environment. Um, that's the layered landscape element of it. So we have you know, our, our environmental landscape, that is the, our plants, um, flora, fauna, uh, we have our, you know, the historic and contemporary cultural landscape. So, you know, that's rooted in a foundation of, of Hawaiian culture and values, um, layered with, with folks who came after um, and brought their culture, brought their gifts with them. So there's a layering of, of cultures there. And then also, you know, the, the biodiversity and the agricultural layering, you know, from the, from the earlier days of, of what is known as the, the, um, Kona field system and um, the incredible abundance that was um, intensively cultivated, you know, by our kupuna that fed, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, I would say hundreds um, in Kona. So the abundance of, of that agricultural culture and history here is, it's insane. It's really insane. And I'm excited to learn more about it with Jesse. He's gonna take us on a, on a huaka'i to a place that he's taking care of, um, Kahalu'u Kuaheva. Um, so anyways, just a little background of the Kona field system. And Jesse, please correct me if I'm wrong. I get excited. Um, but you know, the Kona field system was such an intensively cultivated area. It was 20 miles long three miles wide, extending from Kailua to, I believe, Ho'okena area, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, all of these factors that come into play here in Kona, many of you know our weather patterns are different um, that make it ideal for so many different plants. You know, the um, our, our, rainy, our rainy summers, our, our wet, um, yeah, our rainy summers and our dry winters, our soil with all the basalt is really um, conducive for drainage, plants that like that, slightly acidic. Um, and it's just really a special place. So I, I, 
to celebrate that, um, where we're from and the connections that we have with this Aina um, was just such a wonderful opportunity. And, and one of the fun elements too was to bring in these artists who, who obviously have a connection to this place. Some of them, some of you folks having, uh, you know, generational ties, Mo'oku Ahau, very, very deep connections to Kona. Um, well, uh, Casey has obviously spent time in Hawaii, but is new to living here in Kona, you know, less than less than six months ago. So all of these perspectives and connections that I was really excited to to see to see what would happen ultimately <laughs> through this experience. And I'm so honored um, to present what all of you have created. So thank you. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. Um, uh, la, 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 la. Thank you. Thank you, everyone joining us. Thank you, Miho, for hosting. Well, I wanted to say, I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah. I feel like I should have said thank you, Mina, Ellison, for <laughs> a wonderful show. And, you know, I have to say that since Mina, this is our first curator ever at the Donkey Mill Art Center. And um, before that, all our exhibitions were volunteer based. And, you know, Laurel knows that she has been part of our exhibition team for a long time. And so this is a really um, a special show because since you've started, we've already had a couple shows planned. And so this is her first, you know, independently created exhibition from scratch. Uh, I, and I'm excited about the theme. I'm excited about the group of artists that are here today. Um, and I'm excited about the future and all the different um, ideas that we're gonna explore together, not only uh, in the exhibition field, but also through programs together. So thank you. Mahalo, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys, you guys made it fun and you guys made it easy. So thank you. <laughs> um, I have a couple exciting announcements. And um, one of them is that if you folks didn't know, the pieces on exhibit are all up for nomination for the People's Choice Award. So if you are, when you do come into the exhibit, you can vote. If you are not in Hawaii and you find a photo of the works, you can post them on your social media and tag the donkey mill. And that would count as a vote as well. And um, the piece uh, that has the most votes will get a $50 gift certificate for the gallery shop. So we're excited to offer that to one of our talented artists too. Um, also, our the pieces that are on are for purchase in the exhibition were just launched on our Donkey Mill Gallery online shop. So thanks to Ashley, Allison Tan, Casey also made that happen too. Um, so the works that are for available for purchase are listed on there. So if any of you want to share that with uh, collectors of yours, um, go for it, you know. Um, and then also, I just wanted to do a short plug for the program that's next week. Next week, Miho was talking about the programming associated with exhibitions that um, really, you know, to have the art be that, that vehicle for us to explore um, topics such as food sustainability here in Hawaii. We have Noah Lincoln, Anissa uh, Lucero, and Michael Kramer. Um, Anissa is from the Hawaii Ulu Cooperative, who's doing amazing things um, to promote and share um, Kona's agriculture and agriculture all over, um, but, but so awesome. And then uh, Michael Kramer, he's from the West Hawaii Community Kitchen which is building the facility to help the farmers get their, their product out to the community too. So um, some really exciting things going on in Kona. You know, I, I feel extremely fortunate that these folks are in our own community. Um, and it'll be moderated by the newly elected um, state representative, Janae Capella, who grew up on a coffee farm and has, uh, you know, extra strong connections to, to Kona as well. So that'll be next Thursday, same time as this um, next week. So actually, I don't know if Miho got the links, but there's some um, for the chat. Okay, that can be after. 
but it's on our website too. No worries. Um, so yeah, without further ado, Miho, did I did I miss anything? No, we should start. Yeah, let's get going. Enough of me. So um, <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen. If anyone has questions for each other, like Miho had had mentioned, you can write it in the chat. Or if it's a complex question, because we get those sometimes, you can say you have a question, and then we can unmute you too. So that that'll make it um, easier to share. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So just to give a little bit of a taste of what the exhibition looks like installed, we put some photos on here as well. So we'll get to talk about most of these amazing pieces. Oh, wait, what? Oh, there's Monica too. <laughs> Wow. It's very photogenic. It's a very photogenic exhibition. <laughs> okay, Tara Cronin, you are up first. Thank you. I'm first? Yeah. <laughs> I just dreadedly realized that as I looked through everyone's last name. <laughs> okay, here I go. Thank you guys. Great. Thanks Great. for um, being a part of it. And thank you, Mina and Miho for making it all happen. Um, so, okay, I'll just talk a little bit about what you're looking at. Um, this is, uh, these are three pieces from my project titled Winds, um, as in, as in the wind in the air. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can hear me properly. Um, so I titled it Winds, um, kind of talking to the uh, idea and the, well, just not, just kind of talking to the um, way that wind shapes the earth around us through um, all sorts of patterns of erosion and just natural, you know, topographical patterns. And so I, I basically went around Big Island and I um, captured what I thought to me resembled these places that looked almost like they were telling a story. And these are like specific spots, but um, I think that the land around us always is telling a story. And I kind of wanted to just talk about through the project, how our relationship to the land around us is not very different from the relationship with ourselves and with our own bodies. So that's my little intro. <laughs> Is that too short? <laughs> Is that, should I say more things? No, I mean, if uh, maybe how the concept, how you develop the concept um, and, the, uh, and the process that you, that you experienced. Sure. So, and I was really excited you guys let me do uh, an installation. So thank you guys. That was really fun. Um, so for, for this presentation uh, of the work, I, I, I made it an installation on and into the walls as well. Um, so I like to draw and write a lot. And I basically was, I basically went around taking photographs with film process and printed them and then um, and then I write and draw. In this case, I draw more than I write, right onto the, um, directly onto the prints. Um, and in this way, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of having a conversation with the landscape that I took of that particular one at, you know, for, each, for each image. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of expand that out onto the uh, 3D space um, in this case, so that I can kind of talk about the movement, the change, the history, the time, the changing, ever-changing landscape. 
um, and an ever-changing humanity, which I think they're actually very co closely tied. So, yeah. Question. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, question, please. Tara. What? Yes, hi. Yeah. Hi, Kanani. Kaulu Kukui. My just one question is, the circles, the orbs that permeate through all your piece, um, because I I love orbs, I love circles, the guys. You know, you're just <laughs> orbiting again. You know, I'm stuck out there in space. Huh? So anyway, what's how do you, what's your concept? Why do you do the circles? Or is there um, any kind of guess if you have one or not? I don't know. I can't. I can't fully answer you. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I don't that's know okay. why, but I'm really drawn to circles myself. I no, am. That's, <laughs> that's quite all right. That's quite all right. Um, I totally understand where you're coming from. And to me, that's a good answer. Is that, I like is that, that answer. I like that answer. Thank you. <laughs> Mahalo, James. I, oh, oh, no, no, no. I have another question from Nicole. Um, how yeah. do you relate the winds to our internal experience? How do I, sorry, how do I what the winds? How do you relate the winds to our internal experience? Um, I think I just titled it Winds to talk just about how landscape is formed. Um, but I think I wasn't talking about the winds in particular, but more the result of the wind, which is land. And so I feel that we're, I feel that our internal experience is very um, physical. And I think that a lot of times, sometimes, sometimes whenever people tend to say body and mind or mind and spirit. And I don't think there's an and. I think it's pretty much um, one experience that we, uh, uh oh, my, my internet connection is unstable. Am I still here? Yes, you're still here. Okay. <laughs> That's, that was my message. So yeah, I think that, um, you know, a lot of times I, I'll, I'll, you know, in book or an essay, whatever, people will tend to have a tendency to separate like the psyche from the heart from the body. Um, but it's all together. And I think there are ways to be really in tune with all three. And there, you know, I think that's in being in touch with the land around us is one way to kind of get there. Does that kind of answer your question? <laughs> that was a great answer. Um, I think it's been coming up a lot lately where, you know, you know like that's that immense capacity for us to be able to feel but because of our everyday life we kind of restrict ourselves from feeling to you know move on with our daily you know sort of a grueling experience but i think um what we're not really in touch with is that like a, the wholeness of connecting to our emotions our surroundings but that it is connected you know so i feel like it's a reiterated thing <clears throat> Can you? Yeah, I see, yeah. I, see, I see a lot of movement in this. I see constellations. I see stars. I see uh, hula. Hula is movement, not only dance, but the movement. And the winds, when you title it, the winds, yeah, it's all about moving. It's about that energy that flows through the universe, flows through us. And it's still at times, and it's hurricanes at times. So it's <laughs> a process. So it's like, and it's showing up here. I, and it's cool. I, I like it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, excellent. I'm going to move on to Miss Haida. Mahalo, Tara. Mahalo, Tara. Wow. Okay, well, you know, I'm feeling quite intimidated following Tara because it is so beautifully abstract and sounding so deep. And I'm just, mine is very personal in a way and very concrete. I mean, I did, and also, I mean, into, I know from other themes which are going into history and all that, and I, I did go into history with things, but I haven't, but my basic thing is very, very concrete and visual and what attracted me and how I spent my time 
uh, with the presence of coronavirus, you know, I've been largely confined to the layered landscape of 2000 feet elevation where my home is and my immediate environment in Captain Cook. So, um, I, and I, with that was a restriction with my, with my, and my focus went to my, first to my critters, um, uh, uh, my dog, cats, ch and chickens and the nature around me. And I began lo uh, looking at leaves and took my sketchbook, noticing that all seasons were re often represented on the same tree, which is not, does not happen on the mainland, I believe, uh, where fall is the, uh, the big event. So then I started visiting the Amy Greenwood Ethnobotanical Gardens because they had just opened, looking at native species including the endemic ones. These observations started my first series of the co uh, corner leaf drawings. So it's very concrete and uh, my relationship to the leaves were very personal. My drawings are not idealized botanical ones, uh, but an attempt to capture the adaptations of individual plants affected by climate, soil, conditions um, and infestations. I discovered that many plants, uh, plants are tip, which we consider typically Hawaiian, are actually not endemic even, but are considered canoe plants, which were brought by the early, very early voyagers be, uh, before Captain Cook. And these were uh, essential for the voyagers survival. So we refer to the, you know, I just explained for those who don't know, we refer to the native species as those that came with human, um, without human intervention, uh, brought by wind and talking to terror, you know, I, wind rang a bell immediately, wings and waves. These native species further break down into endemic and indigenous, with endemic being those that have evolved genetically into unique species, which are in a particular region, and some of them just here on our big island and some in Hawaii general. Uh, but um, whereas indigenous can be found, uh, so the canoe plants, are the, are, are the ones like Ulu, Tao, Kalo, and Maya, the bananas. And these are very, very, all very, very important in Hawaiian culture. Most of, you know, and most of our bananas, early bananas have actually been replaced by later introductions because they were more commercially more viable. But um, I believe that um, our Hapai banana might have a connection to these early ones, which, it's, which is a very, very strange banana, because the, the bunch actually goes on the, uh, usually on the stem, under the, in the stem, and is protected by a stem, and looks like a pregnant belly, hence the word Hapai. Um, so, you know, so this is where, you know, it's just a very personal relationship. I feel I'm really getting to know these plants, the individual plants, and they're not necessarily the image we have, like, for example, of, um, of the ohia. I don't, I didn't represent it like with the flower, which we, because we, over here we really think of the flower often, but rather the, uh, the leaves and, and the, the seeds. And often, uh, you know, so I represent leaves which are just colored and, uh, and, but, or bug bitten, but very, very interesting. So, um, yeah, so also on my walks, I was enchanted by a huge leaf um, of, the, of the huge, of the giant castor bean plant, which uh, really fascinated me. But um, uh, it, you know, the castor bean has been used culturally and traditionally for centuries and in, in that it produces the purest of oils and even today is a favorite in racing cars. Uh, castor oil has also been used for medicinal purposes. I don't know if you might be, have been exper 
have experienced that in your past, you know, but I have, you know, uh, at my, you know, which uh, tells you about my age. Um, but um, the parts of the bean, however, are extremely toxic, extremely poisonous. And um, also the, the plant is invasive. So that is, uh, this plant, um, like others that are invasive and threaten native girls, uh, are not welcomed on the island. And because they, have, they may have both good uh, qualities, but they also have very bad properties in that they, um, uh, are, they threaten our uh, native growth, our indigenous growth. So, but I'm fascinated by all this. And, you know, a lot of our really on, uh, decorative plants, I mean, our very vibrant plants are often uh, later introductions, which have become uh, uh, invasive. So, you know, so uh, that's why I call this, this new series I've started with the castor bean being the first one. Uh, you know, um, I, you know, I call the, this series paradoxical plants because they have both good and bad sides to them. Now, now if you're interested in plants, so uh, in personal experience in making your acquaintance with particular plants and, uh, and then also with their background and what they were used for, uh, both in, in, our, in the culture and, uh, and uh, actually have a, and make a personal acquaintance, I would recommend that you go to the Amy Greenwell uh, Ethnobotanical Gardens and it's open on Sundays between 9 and 2 p.m. 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. Mahalo for being with you. Thank you so much, Haida. I, mean, I was, when Haida told me about the, you know, the tile piece, it was so, I mean, her skills to capture the essence of that plant, like you're saying, not as a botanical illustration, but to really capture the, um, the character and the process, the evolution of each leaf, what it's going through. Um, but when she presented the idea of the castor bean um, and it being larger than the other, other pieces, really to me was was fascinating because as a as an invasive plant like she was saying it 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 can feel um you know overwhelming if you relate it to um i say to hawaiian people you know of this something coming from the outside um and being so aggressive and hardy but then knowing that it has obviously it's it's a plant it it has a greater purpose if we acknowledge the plant and learn a little bit about it, you know? So um, I was really fascinated when she presented this idea about the castor bean plant. So thank you so much, Haida. Haida, uh, I'm not sure if you're reading the chat, but you have some compliments in there if you can read it. Um, sorry? Uh, from Tara, they feel like beautiful leaf portraits uh, mm -hmm. and then, uh, and Jaya, who, who says, crunch, crunch, the illustrated textures, I can hear them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of them are, have are dried out and are, are certainly affected by the environment, even though our area has had, uh, uh, has had an amazing amount of rain. We, I think the, uh, probably the most rain we ever had in, in this area for 30 years or more. Mm. So... And you know, instead of grass, we grow moss now. Uh, awesome! Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mahalo, Haida. Thank you. Mahalo. Oh, sorry. Let me move. Okay, Anjaya. Okay. Where do I start? Um, so I'm a book artist. I like to make handmade books and all the books I make are inspired by um, conversations or experiences I have on Big Island. So when I went to the Mauna Kea protest, I learned from an elder how to 
interact with the island through the lenses of Hawaiian mythology, um, specifically the goddesses Pele and Hi'iaka, who are sisters. Um, and so Pele's uh, deconstructive nature and Hi'iaka's resurrect, uh, resurrection powers create this divine balance in their sisterhood. And um, I made this installation to show the balanced weight of their influence on the island and how we should adopt this, um, this balance in our lifestyle, whether it's our career, our diet, our, you know, if you live as a farmer or a city dweller, I think it's important to be aware of what you give and what you take from the island or else if you, you know, took more than you needed and you never gave back the, the balance would um, fall to a consequential extreme. So this is an interactive piece if you visited. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no sign saying that you can interact with the pieces, but you can. Uh, you can handle and touch and look through the books. They're all empty journals and sketchbooks. Um, the idea is that the stories are by you and um, on one end, so this, what we're looking at right now is the Hiyaka book. Uh, so each book are, the goddesses are represented with texture and color. So here we see um, Hiyaka being symbolized with growth and sprouts and moss um, next to volcanic rock, which we which will, which I feel like when I first look at volcanic rocks, like all the pahoy hoy, it doesn't look like um, there's any potential for growth, but that's Hiiaka's power. Um, so together their life, death, life, rebirth, uh, decomposition and um, nurture for growth. And we should all adopt that in our lifestyle. Um, on the other end of this, seesaw installation, I torched the hell out of the other side um, to also show Pele's, you know, destructive nature. Um, everywhere I hear Pele is the destroyer, but I see that as such an important aspect in our lives because we can bring in very harmful habits, harmful words, um, maybe not intentionally all the time, but it's really important to look within and deconstruct our minds and decompose anything that we don't need so that we could um, fertilize uh, growth that is healthy for the future for yourself, but also in your community. Um, so that's my piece. I think I talked about most of it. Um, <laughs> Um, I don't know if there's a picture of the book in, t in the center, the Hi'iaka book, but one of the Hi'iaka books has um, an egg exposed on the spine. Um, and I'm sure all of you have heard stories of how Pele carried Hi'iaka in an egg form um, by her bosom across the Pacific Ocean to the Hawaiian Islands. Anyway, I'm sure you all know that. Um, yeah, and so um, I think that's all I want to talk about. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry we don't have a picture of, of that beautiful that beautiful um, egg piece in the book. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. This is a beautiful. Uh, it's really hard to uh, take pictures. Of. <laughs> Can I make one comment? Yeah. Yeah. Can I make a comment? Yeah. What, I, what I like about this piece too is on the bottom, the, the rocks, you have a coral, piece of coral. Yeah. Coral is Kanaloa. Kanaloa is God of the ocean, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he has a hand in that growth where everything starts in the ocean, it comes onto land and Pele. So they all interact. And I said, oh, and when I saw that coral piece, I said, yeah. So Kanaloa mm -hmm. is also represented in there. And Kanaloa is the, to me, but that is your subconscious. That's where all growth, energy, sparks of life, and everything comes from. The idea when you get that eureka moment, that's Kanaloa talking to you. So there's more. Pele is there and it's great. The Hina, Ku Hina, as they also, um, yeah, Hiyaka, but there's more to it in there. That, let me tell you, uh, strong piece. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you. Mahalo, mahalo. I, I don't know, but I feel like the, the process of just organically saying comments at the end of the presentation, if we have time, is kind of nice. To yeah. Hear voice. Should we open up to that more casual style versus the chat? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, do both, but. Yeah, we can do both. Yeah. I please think. feel free to comment at the end. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Oh, wow. yeah. So can I sneak in a final comment? Yes. Which is that I, I love that they're all empty and that these are, you know, that it's up to us, up to you to tell the story. And um, there's something about that that's very powerful for yeah. me. Yeah, to remind us of our responsibility as well. Yeah, and that it's our choice, you know? Yeah, lovely. Thank you. But the texture is so amazing, you know. I'm, I did see it in, in person there, and I really wanted just to handle them, but I, I was uh, too timid to do that. But it, they're so beautiful. They're absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Is is Akiko here? No, oh, she she's not joining us. Okay. Okay. Okay, I wonder if that's there's somebody in the main space. Okay, here we go. Miss Bailey. Aloha. Hi everyone. I'm Bailey Ferguson. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity, Nina. It was really um, a great challenge for me to move my um, painting. Um, I've been doing a lot of painting about the sea and the ocean. Um, and so to move that back onto land and to investigate um, the Kona, Kona's la layered landscape, which I feel like my technique of, of, of layer painting really complements uh, the show, show theme. So it was really fun to work with the green palette and I had to do a little work around that. So thank you. Um, so the, the title of this piece is called Kona's Resilient Drylands. Um, and so in thinking about um, the importance of Kona's agriculture history, uh, I was inspired to speak to the future of Kona's agricultural landscape, but especially in the wake of climate change, um, which is something that I have on my mind daily. Um, <laughs> so um, when we started this, when I started thinking about this project, um, Nina gave us all, all the artists a, um, a PDF that was about 120 pages and it was called Namala Okona, the Gardens of Kona. And um, it was a report about the land use history in Kona and it was published in 1989 by Marion Kelly. And, um, and that was really helpful for me just because I knew, you know, I've lived in Kona for two years. Um, and so I've been on Hawaii Island for six years, but um, just new to Kona. And so that, that, that book really, um, the report really gave me an understanding of um, pre-contact agriculture and then post-contact. And, um, and so there's a quote that stood out for me and it was on um, page 73. So if anybody has that um, um, handout. Um, and it was, um, so the author says, the environmental conditions of Kona are unique to the islands. And she talks to um, like the rapid rise of elevation, Kona sheltered location um, in the lee of the mountains of Hualalai and Mauna Loa and the onshore breezes, which cause cloud cover and rain. And um, she goes on to say that here are the economic plants required to, uh, required to support Hawaiian society thrived under the care of Hawaiian horticulturalists. These conditions made the Kona district a very important resource for the Hawaiian subsistence economy in pre-contact times. So in thinking about that um, and the importance of Hawaiians agriculture, like you were talking about in the introduction, Mina, is just that we fed from these lands, you know, we fed a lot of people. And so this, this artwork, um, so let me back up just, um, you know, after reading that quote, it reminded me of an article that was published, um, a study that was published last year in 2019 um, by Natalie Kirishima, um, Lucas Fortini, and Tamara Tickton, 
and um, that was titled The Potential of Indigenous Agricultural Food, Food Production Under Climate Change in Hawaii. And that study gave us a look at how, um, well, it looked at three different types of agriculture that's used in Hawaii. Um, we have the irrigated pond field, dry land agriculture, and colluvial agriculture. And what we use in Kona is the dry land agriculture and how um, it, it can potentially, if we were to use all of our agriculture land, we could produce enough food for the entire state in our current times with current um, consumptions. You know, almost, you know, um, you know, we would have food that would come in from, you know, the sea as well and other types of trade, but like, that's a really important idea, um, especially since we, I think the, the study said that we import 94% of our food. And I thought it was in the 80s, but to hear 94%, it's just kind of mind blowing. So I was really inspired by that and ran with that idea. Um, and so what I'm depicting here in my painting, um, this is the Moku of Kona, both North and South Kona. And the study talks about, um, so I've, I've used like an iridescent paint to highlight the areas that are resilient in the end of century climate change scenarios. So Natalie and her co-authors speak to um, how, you know, with the change, there's three different ch climate change scenarios that they looked at. And the area that I have highlighted are areas that will be resilient with like change in weather patterns, um, change in rainfall, you know, higher temperatures and things like that. So, um, so yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, through this work, I was hoping to, you know, give a visual awareness of our role and ability to produce food um, through indigenous ancestral methods and how we can, you know, how there's potential to feed our whole state here. So um, yeah, so I guess that's it. <laughs> I hope that made sense. <laughs> um, I have, uh a question about bringing up the importance of maybe the Apua system and mm -hmm. historically how that was so important and how that can be adopted to modern modern times. I don't, mm -hmm. or maybe. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not like an expert in the Apua system. And in fact, like my painting, when I first started the painting, like I did, I mapped in the Apua and I wasn't sure how I was going to incorporate the Apua into into it. Um, you know, read the 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 PDF handout that that Mina gave uh, gave us of the land survey in 1983. Um, you know, I just I guess I just understood a little bit more about how that system could um, is to, to trade in between. But I I just I don't know. I guess for me. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not I'm not an expert in that in that system, but um and That's if anybody good. else wants to chime in, I mean there's so many, you know, other um others that are also really more maybe more expertise have more expertise than I do. So, I'm just I'm I'm so fascinated with it because we're we're in North Kona and we're um uh we we we're farmers and uh, we live in the mountains. And so when we see, when we go down to the dry lands, it's a completely different ecosystem. And, and as Heidi, Heidi said, we've experienced the most rain in, I don't know, than Kona has ever experienced before. And like, so now what we're experiencing is that the problems of agriculture has become more like heightened, like rat lungworm is become more of an issue. And these are the things that people are thinking of, um, which would require more like un unsustainable techniques to grow food. So I, I don't know how it would work, but people used to live in the dry lands because it wasn't um, habitable, I guess. I don't know if someone can chime in, habitable to live in the mountains. Like the mountains was the place where we stored water, where we, grew certain crops and we would harvest, we would forage, and then we would bring it back down to the coast. So I'm just very fascinated with how it could possibly work. You all have to come back Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is where it's gonna to continue to go, so. Yeah. 
that's that's great. I'm literally looking forward to that discussion. I didn't know yeah. that there was Hawaiian kitchen co-op starting. I mean, not the co-op, but the Hawaiian, what was it called? Uh, community kitchen. Yeah, yeah. my community kitchen. Yeah. I did about yes. that. No, yeah. and thank you. Oh, yeah. No, Sorry, um, Bailey, I, like what you were saying about the layering of your pieces. I mean, when I when the concept was developing, I really thought of you um, and your techniques that you use. And, and it made me excited, as you're saying, too, to see what you might do in your expressions of landscapes um, you know, compared to your seascape. So I am so it's it turned out really, really beautifully. So wow. Mahalo. I also thank you so much because seeing land from above is way different than seeing it from, it's like a totally different feeling. So this is such a beautiful piece. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really oh my gosh, it. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Why? Okay. It's oh, so gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, I think in this piece, <laughs> iridescent painting application that I use yeah. by those dry land areas that are super resilient and then yeah. you know I guess you know it reminds me of like flying in a plane above yeah above, you know agricultural fields and just different crops that are growing and um yeah I, I use like hatches in my work to represent just like change or energy and I, I was able to really explore that um application process so <laughs> yeah I, I really like the Di it's so dynamic and um yeah and, and the shape and the way it's just kind of it's as though it's like moving across the canvas <laughs> oh definitely Mahalo. okay thank you so much bailey Mahalo. okay let's see okay jesse Hey, aloha kako. Aloha mai. Uh, so I guess a couple of months ago, um, Kahakio and myself went to visit Mina and um, we were picking up some wood from her property to uh, complete another project. And while we, while we were there, Mina um, had told us about an uh, exhibition that she was curating um, and wanted us to enter something in it. Uh, at first, I was kind of hesitant because I've never entered anything into an exhibition. But uh, once I heard the title, Namala Lair Landscapes, um, I was in it. Uh, myself being a farmer and aloha aina, a uh, person who works in a forest, I thought um, this would be a great opportunity and it'd be a lot of fun. Um, so I knew I wanted to work with something that kind of um, spoke to tradition and modern time. Uh, I knew I wanted to do some kind of implement uh, farming wise. Uh, so I decided to go with the uh, o'o or the, the digging stick. So it's something that was used uh, traditional times. It was used uh, during the early coffee plantations, during the sugar plantations. And even today, people are still using the o'o as a um, primary tool. So from there, um, I wanted to start at the top, so kind of work my way back in history. Um, in a way. And so I wanted to work with Lahala. So Lahala was something that I thought of when I think of um, coffee farming and I think about the Mo'olelo and the stories I've heard from a lot of the old timers, uh, primary theme that they talk about is, um, you know, they do their coffee picking, they do their coffee farming during a certain portion of the year. Um, and then on the off season, they'd be doing their Lahala weaving making hats, making other kind of um, things for people to buy so that they can make money during the year. So I decided to go with this kind of cover that goes on the top um, and it's woven in a way that kind of represents the, the coffee baskets. So traditionally the coffee farmers would pick and they'd have these big lahala baskets that they would um, let the coffee beans fall into. So from there, I kind of um, worked my way down. So in, I know a lot of other traditions as well, but in Hawaiian tradition, um, weaving, um, weaving and, you know, making rope, all those kind of things, they also um, symbolize, you know, um, something solid. You, you're locking something in, you're staying, um, you're making an affirmation, yeah, to these kind of things. So 
the Lahala was kind of that in the beginning of um, these traditions that were being woven in. And as I continued, I thought um, I do a carving of weaving. So that would be uh, an example of these even more solid traditions that have been um, steadfast through these times from um, modern going back to traditional. And then I guess uh, another important thing for me is when we're talking about mala, um, we're talking about farms, it's something that's generational, yeah, um, farming. So you're not gonna start a farm with the idea that, um, you know, my, my children aren't gonna do this, my grandchildren aren't gonna do this. You have the idea that this is gonna feed my children. Uh, the more work I can do in my lifetime, the more they'll be supported and so on and so forth. And then when you inherit, um, these farms and these traditions, you, you're constantly thinking about, you know, the work that my parents put into this, the work that my grandparents, that my great grandparents and so on and so forth, um, the work that they put in to allow me to be here in this time. So um, generation was an important theme. Um, and from there, I kind of, when I was thinking of the name, um, I was thinking, what, what is something that can kind of symbolize generation? So um, I went to my resources, my Hawaiian language resources, and um, kalo is always an important uh, plant to us as Hawaiians. Um, it's probably the number one most important plant to us. It uh, has a very close relationship to us as Hawaiians. Um, it is the older sibling to us, halo anaka. So I decided to go with that. Um, so in Kona, before coffee and before sugar, Kalo and sweet potato were the main crops that were grown here. And um, there was a real intimate relationship with that. So uh, the generations of Kalo, so nowadays we, we plant something, um, it grows, we harvest, we pull the whole thing and we collect what we have. But traditionally um, the, the aina, the ground, as well as the sea was like the refrigerator, yeah? So you wouldn't go into your refrigerator and pull out a whole pot of stew, heat up the whole thing and just eat a bowl of it, yeah? you would um, you know, take a bit out and you'd leave the rest inside the refrigerator. So for us as Hawaiians, when we plant kalo, um, it forms the oha or the ohana by all the little shoots that come up. So traditionally in Kona, we'd harvest the main one and we'd let the other ones continue to grow. Um, and then you had different generations. So you had the first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, and the fifth generation. So um, I, decided to go with the fifth generation because I think that is kind of, um, it's an important number to me, the fifth generation. Um, we go back to the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom and um, the traditions that we've been able to keep since then. And I also think about how, um, you know, what is the most generations you could possibly have in a household in one lifetime? And I think that the fifth generation was kind of the peak of what I could think of. I couldn't imagine um, someone's great, 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 great grandparent um, living with their, their grandchild and so forth. So um, kokole is the word that we use for the fifth generation of kalo to, to be harvested. And this is the generation that's, you know, been through the exhaustion of all the nutrients sucked out of the soil. Um, the weeds have started to cover over the patches, but still in that um, adversity, it uh, survives and it can grow and when harvested and replanted in a new patch, it'll start its own ohana and it'll begin a whole new um, cycle of that, uh, that life. Mahalo. <laughs> just to add, Jesse. Mahalo. 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 Jesse. Uh, just wanted to add, Jesse, when I went up, dropped my piece off, uh, Mina <laughs> handed your Oh, oh, to me, and I and I grabbed and held on to it, and I looked at the piece, and I, man, bro, the mana is strong in that. Oh, so you did, a, you, you did a great job, and the hala piece on the top, and to hala is to transform. You have the food has mm. to do with yeah. our ancestors transform it. So you have it at the top. That's the connections to our deities, our ancestors, mm. like how you said. And so it's like, man, that that is a strong piece. Mahalo. Oh, mahalo, no, uncle. Yeah, I wanted to comment too. I um I spend a lot of time in the gallery. I'm up at the front, and um, I I um, immediately noticed this piece, Mahalo for making it, and it does. It has so much 
it projects so much power and so much strength. And I love how um, it kind of like it, it doesn't necessarily look like it's floating, but it's like it's very <laughs> upright and it's just, yeah, it's really, really powerful piece. Um, hello, Casey. Mm -hmm. Oh, long, long. Is there anyone else that wanted to share or no? I thought I heard some other voice. But I, I hope you're okay with the stand that I put it on, Jesse. I think it from your explanation, it kind of fits, right? <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. That's exactly what we were talking about. We were yeah. it's, it's grounded. No. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, I'm so sorry. I did it again. I didn't do the, sorry. Oh, that's so okay. Yeah, the wave. Yeah, this is so beautiful. I'm failing. Oh. You know, it's it's is incredible. This, is this for sale? No. It, Sorry, to bring it, that up. It is, and actually, I wanted to ask Jesse if the price included the split that we have with the mill, because right now I think it's five hundred and fifty dollars, which I was like, oh. It, we can talk about it later. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, like I said, this is the first time I put something in exhibition, so. Oh. And, <laughs> and, and you guys. Uh, you, you might have a bitter in me. Um, but like Jesse was saying, I didn't hear from him. I, I, I talked story with him. I was trying to read him like, mm, we'll see, we'll see. And then and then he was like, it's done. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I was working on another project at the time and I was counting my hours and I was like, oh, will I have time to finish this? I don't uh, want to say yes if I won't. No, but, um, in incredible. Incredible. Thank you so much. Mahalo. Mahalo oh. for this. Okay, here we go. Oh, right next to Uncle Kanani's piece. Perfect. Okay. Okay, do I start, I guess? Okay, aloha. <laughs> um, I've always learned that to understand a piece, you need to understand the artist. So basically, real quick. Um, I was born in Hilo, raised in Kona. So I graduated from Kona Wayne High School in 1968. So you know how old I am. My... Uh, Sophomore, junior year, I picked coffee in Kona for this Dumaguin family. And you see right in the middle, that's their farm. Their house is up on the left, you can't see it, but that's a drying bed. I have a blue Jeep in there because I remember the blue Jeep because Joe Dumaguin is one year older than me. We used to at the end of the day, swap all the bags and take it down to the pulpy mill and pulp it and spread it out. And they had their own dryer. So for me, that this is <laughs> personal. So, and the basket and, you know, with the cone of coffee because the father used to sit on a step right in front of the door, right below the uh, drying bed. And he'd weave the picking baskets out of bamboo. And I watched him and, and the belts were made from the straps of the old, uh, the pulping. You can see the door and then the pulping. And that's me spreading. Joe would be pulping that. And that's the blue Jeep. We had fun with that blue Jeep. <laughs> So, and, and, and you were saying like, uh, no, Mala, so, so I'm thinking, okay, the garden, but where's the garden? So all, jack, all work and no play make Jack's a dull boy. So right at the bottom of the, the basket and the, and the cherries, you see the, that's a beach house in KA. So that's the Dumagin's beach house. And we used to go down there, hang out on the weekends and they'd have chicken fights. That's why the two roosters are there. So right in front of that would be this off to the left, you see like a guy is pushing somebody off of the cliff. There was a diving area over there. And we used to go out there and jump in and dive off to the left. And you see one guy's bombing the next guy. So you never jump in as the first guy because the second guy going to bomb you without a third guy pushing you over. So that was having fun. Yeah. And, uh, that's Kealakiku Bay. Way off in the distance is Ka'avaloa. My grandma was born and raised in Ka'avaloa. So the family is from there. I found out that the family is tied in with the Kahulamu family and the Alapais. So the family goes back to Kona. That's on my mom's side. 
So up to the up in the going from from the ocean because everything is connected to the ocean in the Kumulipo. This is about the Kumulipo, the Hawaiian creation chant. In a way with the mass ferment, then everything solidifies. Then your lights come in, which is your sun, your moon, which is Mahina. And so if you look real close, you got to go up to you see little white dots. Those are the water molecules that eventually evaporates, goes up into the clouds and your condensation line, and that starts your hydrologic cycle. And off to the left in there, you see two, like two guys planting something in the clouds. That is Kane and Kanaloa. So there's a story that Kane and Kanaloa comes down to earth. Kane with his oh oh, his staff, Jesse's oh oh, he strikes the ground. He opens it up, water comes out. Kanaloa kneeling down has his, his, uh, um, his ava plants and he plants it. And after he plants it, they move along. He op Kane opens it up, plants, uh, and Kanaloa plants the ava. And they go on there. It's like your Johnny Appleseed story. So that's what they do. So that's the, the planting and everything. And then you see the there's three birds up there. But actually, they, there's a deeper meaning to that because the diving place is also a launching area. When you when you say when we die, we go to a jumping off area, and from there you jump off and you go and join your ancestors. But you gotta be a bit uh, able to take that leap. So the diving area day, I, I forgot the name of it. Anyway, so that, and then you go up to the first circle, to the circle to the left, that's Kohala Mountain. My grandparents on my dad's side come from Kohala. And right in the middle, you see there's a white line. That's the Kohala field system. That's tied, they say, that also ties to the Kona field system, which uh, we'll talk about that later, which you folks already mentioned. But right in that first circle on the bottom, there's the, those flowers. That's the wheelie wheelie. So there's an old Hawaiian saying that says, when the willy willy tree blooms, the mano bites. And that's usually this time, I, which is going through the end of that season. So that's the same one more, but that's the same time the coffee blooms. So that kind of gives you a date in time and the circle above the mountaintops, all four of them is their pico. So in the Hawaiian culture side, that's the pico. That's the center we connect up with our ancestors and thus the stars and you have the comet, you know, off to the center section, that's Mauna Kea. You know, it's a sacred site. So threw him in there, so that gives you the time of season when he came through. And you go to the third set, the circle to the right, you have a hand holding something. So when is the best time to plant? Full moon, Mahina. So Mahina is full moon, and there's a chant where you hold it, and when you're planting your, your seed and your seedlings, you chant this chant and you make it like that plant is so heavy that when you put it in the ground, you take back in and you chant it and you chant in this chant so that, 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 that tone, your voice, it's all about frequency and vibration that you're giving to the plant for it to grow. You're actually saying you fully bloomed already. You're going to grow to this huge plant and you're going to survive it. So that's why you, you give that hint of, man, this thing is heavy, even though it's a small plant. So you give that, that intention to grow to that fulfillment. And then you have uh, Hualalai. Had a lot of times up there with the Duat family up in Hualalai, Hualalai. And then you come down to the right, that's your Mauna Loa. And that's where you see the off to the right, there's the gray section when it starts to rain. And picking, when you're picking in the uh, coffee season, you know, come 2.30, 3 o'clock, you're going to get wet because it always rains. You know, I, I was a geography major at UH Chilo for about three years. Then we talk about the Kona, and I did a paper on Kona coffee and the hydrologic cycle that he has its own and everything else. And so we get to the Kona, uh, the Mala field system. So that's why you have the stone wall with all your kalo, I didn't mean, Jesse mentioned kalo, it's haloa, that's our oldest brother. So, you know, he's there and there's the ulu up on the top. So the ulu is another connection with our ancestors and that has a story too. So there's all these myths and legends and everything that comes in. And if you look real good, you're gonna see the, the, the honeybees, you're gonna see the dragonflies. So in the, in the creation chain, everything starts from the ocean, comes on to land, the fish, the polyps is why all the circles. They're gonna ask what uh, Kara in the beginning, what the circles mean for you. Here's my circles. The circles down there is your polyps. Your polyps is your building blocks of life in the ocean. From the ocean comes down to land and everything. And there's again, there's a number three. Yeah, your ocean, 
your terra firma, and your lanya. And that's how we as Kanakas look at it. It's these three realms that are all connected and, and it, it'll always be connected. Like uh, in the ocean, uh, there's, there's in the Kumulipo, in the creation chant, uh, there's the he'e or the octopus in the ocean. There's the ala he'e tree on land that's in the dry land forest up at Puanahulu. Okay, the kupi I mean, the, the pakui kui, only the orange dot on that fish. There's the kukui tree on land. So there's always a connection with the ocean to the land. And that's why in the kumulipa, that's why you see the kohola or the, or the whales and the porpoise. Okay, that was in Mimi and the white tip shark. I asked my grandma, what is our amakua? She says, it's the white tip. So the white tip is in there. This is kind of my, my signature and for my ancestor. Man. And then right above the dolphin's nose, you can see an eye. Okay, that is that is the mo'o, okay? When we say my mo'o puna, my grandchild, mo'o is uh, the back. Well, mo'o is the lizard, puna is spring. So the back of the spring, is that's, like, that's your. So there's that connotation and so that, it has deeper meanings. I mean, I mean, I'm born with this. But anyway, from there you move off to the right, then you see all the red fish, the red fish, the polyps, then the OP and then the OPI, then you go up to your corals, your, your vanas, all the different vanas, and all, this. And all that's in the Kumulipo. And, and they, they name all this. And the PPP, the KUPP, and I took a couple of old beer cans in there showing that what's happening today, you know, so I gotta address the. <laughs> The trashing of the land and everything like that. So I had to throw one little spot in this. You know, we can't avoid that. We can't, we hopefully can try it. But yeah, so there's so much other stuff going on in here and it's deep seated. For me, it's like I grew up, um, uh, I am so interested in parapsychology way back in the 60s, 70s, you know, uh, psychokinesis, mental telepathy. And I learned about the culture because it's the second marriage for me. My wife keeps me culturally correct. She's a Kumu Hula now. She danced with Halao uh, Kui 15 years and she went with Unukupu Kupu at Community College and Taupuri uh, Tenguru, his husband, uh, graduated her. So she's a Kumu Hula. She keeps me culturally correct. So I get scoldings all the time. No, it's not like that. It's supposed to be like this. Oh, this is it. This is like so. I said, okay, I'm learning. So I'm still learning. And so everything in the in here is all personal. It goes back, and that's why if you look at the cost of this, that's how much it's going to cost for me to let this go because I don't want to let this go. <laughs> so anyway, any questions? There's more to it, but there's not enough time. Mahalo, thank you so much. It, it, we've, we've joked that, that we could do a scavenger hunt inside <laughs> your piece. <laughs> yeah, I but, could. Uh, but thank you so much. Okay, we got we to gotta move on, but we, we'll film that video, yeah, that yep. we can do and share. But Mahalo, thank you. Whew. Yes, I definitely you want, to, want to, to listen to this again. You know, there's so many uh, details, and I want to find all those little details. <laughs> Exactly. Ah, oh, so much. Thank you. Okay, Chris. Is Chris here? Yes, I am. Oh, there, 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 there. Thank you so much. I'm humbled to be part of this amazing group of artists. Um, I want to say thank you, Mina, for including me and asking me to be part of it. I am um, an invasive species of Kona. I've been here for 10 years, but I have great reverence for the culture and the land being also um, from somewhere else very far away. So um, I was, it's kind of interesting to see the take that everybody's taken with a the theme of layered landscapes. You can, there's, there was just so much that I, I was a little bit overwhelmed by um, you know the different directions that you can go and obviously everybody's gone in a in an amazing direction so i was looking at the history of kona even though i did not get your pdf but i guess our heads were in the same direction and the layering of you know what makes kona as a, a magnificent um, you know coffee growing area and how it got there and the, the different circumstances that are not only uh, environmental, but also cultural 
that have made it to be one of the best, most renowned coffee uh, coffees in the world. So, um, so of course, you know, my main thought is Hualalai. You know, it's like, okay, this is this. These are the slopes. This is where it happens, and and the combination of uh, the the soil. You know, that rich volcanic soil and the and the, the altitude and the very particular rain patterns, you know, which is different than the rest of the island, you know, in terms of climate. And um, all of those added to, you know, trying to work with, um, you know, the technique was to try to work with just from, from the raw material, which I chose wood because it's a natural material to build up layers of paint and carving and natural fibers. And um, so, and, and then the weaving of, uh, you know, the, you know, the elements that make this area so unique and so, so rich and, and so honored to be calling my home now. So um, I, you know, I don't, as much as I respect, I don't, Oh, and the other thing about the piece is that it's, a, it's called reflection. So I also wanted to show the idea that nothing is just straight, you know, there's always so many angles to look at something. So you can look at it one way and then you turn it around and oh, well, the, yeah, there's no reason why the, the dark cannot be the sky and the light, the light can come from below, you know, because there's so much richness historically coming from from the land and the stories that it can tell us. So, so um, that's how the piece came about. And I think if we would have had this conversation with all of you, <laughs> it may have been something totally different. <laughs> but um, it was, a, you know, I have participated in some of the Kona Coffee Festival art shows and this is by far the most exciting and inspiring um, show that I have entered for the coffee fest because it really gave you, you know, uh, uh, you know, it gave you an idea to think of, you know, deeply about what what this means and what it means to all of us. So, so thank you. Mahalo. Thank you so much, Chris. Really, really thank beautiful. Yeah, I've, I've loved place. every bit of every story. So. Aww. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Casey. Mahalo. Hello. Um, Hi. Well, yes, I would like to also thank uh, Mina for inviting me to participate. Um, I'm very new to Kona, so it's a bit intimidating. Um, but um, because of that, all of the sort of sensory information that I'm absorbing is very new and fresh. So I decided to focus on that and create pieces that are um, representative of my interpretations of Kona. Um, and so I've used phenomenology as inspiration, which is the study of human consciousness through lived experience. Um, part of what I find fascinating about that is thinking about how no two humans or no two people have the exact same experience. Um, we all have our own bodies. And so, um, you know, we pick up on different um, phenomena and things like that. So um, with these pieces, I wanted them also to be kind of spontaneous because I wanted sort of the sort of subconscious experiences I've been experiencing or the experiences I've been experiencing um, come from my subconscious as well. Um, so there would be an element of surprise for me at the same time. Um, so these pieces, um, they're very fragmented. I think they can also reference memory and also, um, how, um, our, the experiences that we have are also constructed by our own systems of belief and our own ideology, which I also find really fascinating. Um, and then another layer to it is that things have been rather tumultuous in the past, well, I don't know, for, for a while. So I also wanted to create pieces that were very celebratory and joyful. And um, I wanted to emphasize the more 
um, positive aspects of my experiences with Kona. So um, yes, in a nutshell, that's what these pieces are about. They're very visual and they're um, very much about describing um, you know, phenomena that I have been experiencing. And hopefully, um, you know, that resonates with the viewer as well. So um, in explaining some of the layers, it definitely references the ocean, it references volcanic activity, it references um, the layering of the flora here as, uh, you know, just that the plants are very layered and very vibrant. The sunsets are very vibrant. Um, it is a very, very colorful place. So, and I also, I wanted to um, mostly uh, focus on my like um, initial responses to um, just to create a piece that, yeah, that is very fresh and just very, um, uh, what is the word I'm trying to think of? I guess, I mean, I guess you could talk about, or um, when thinking about abstraction, um, not trying to be too specific, I don't know. I think I'm just going on a tangent now, but yes. <laughs> no. Thank you, Casey. I like, I love how it just like snapshots, like, like you were saying, your time here has been quick, almost, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but like a blur, you know, it's kind of like, woo, yeah, snapshots. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mahalo, mahalo. Okay, Gerald. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Um, so this is my triptych. It's really based on sort of kind of like a journal idea where um, these are things that I plant on my farm and especially during a lot of the shutdowns. The idea of thinking about food and thinking about um, As Bailey was saying, like things that are shipped here. Um, you know, I grew up on a farm, but I wasn't really, it, you know, that gene didn't really pass on to me <laughs> from my parents. Um, I appreciated the land, I appreciated all of that. It's not till later where I began to make my own connections um, to the land. Um, again, it was passed down to me. So I live on a coffee farm um, and really kind of reevaluating, um, rethinking, uh, reestablishing um, who I am, really. You know, we are a product of our environment, of our land. So it becomes um, a full extension of you as a human being. Um, so it's very, it's a very literal piece. You know, I sort of growing pumpkins right now or winter squash, um, bitter melons, uh, these wing beans or palang as my dad called them. So it's really reconnecting to that knowledge. I think my dad had, um, I, I just remember having abundance. I know there's a lot of, um, there was a lot of food that was exchanged from the sea. There's a lot of fish that was exchanged. Um, my dad loved bitter melons. So he grew a lot of that. Um, so kind of reconnecting to some, some of those earlier memories um, and knowledge uh, living on the farm. Um, so the piece is actually on Japanese paper. And this is paper I actually didn't make. Um, I, I do make paper, but this is uh, thicker Japanese paper. Um, the textural elements that I create is from burnt masking tape. So on this detail, it's the two ends you can see. Um, the stitched line is from cotton string. The cotton string is set into um, sort of a container of black dye. 
Um, I had to adjust my piece because the length of the string sitting in that die, the intention was for that die to really seep upwards to um, fill in or color in the paper. So in my, um, so you can see the ink on the bottom in these glass bases, the actual parts where the ink actually reached the paper is only that dark bottom. And then I kind of cheated a little by um, dyeing or painting in the rest of the stitched cotton string. Um, the branches in the foreground, um, I also am interested in the idea of like floral uh, ideas, of arrangement, ikebana, um, using natural form um, and finding beauty in sort of dead things. <laughs> um, these are uh, again from my farm. Uh, so just really appreciating how life and death are connected. The, um, I, in, within the piece, uh, I included myself. Again, sort of calling into question of who am I? Uh, how do, you know, we're constantly defining, um, well, I am uh, defining as a teaching artist, what do I have? What knowledge do I have? What do I pass on? Um, so a lot of it is, I think, we have to look at the world with that sort of child look wonder or childlike wonder. Um, so I approach my art in that way. Um, a lot of it's kind of experimental. Um, I've worked with masking tape. I actually love stitching into paper. Um, so it's during the pandemic, I think my connection to just this idea of going back to my roots, which is basically drawing um, and just having uh, sort of these biographical moments. So really taking life and reinterpreting, reinterpreting that into uh, my art. Um, so the layered aspects, I think just come, <laughs> there's so many that you can actually read into. Um, the, the, how the string um, and ink idea. Again, it's that, you know, our land is our teacher. Um, and then being sort of connected through the spine. So in my self-portrait in the middle, um, I did include my uh, back. So I, I think for me, the back, again, if you think about farming, um, and I, I just came from like having back issues. <laughs> The, that whole idea of like having a strong back, working in the land. Um, so yeah, I guess I can talk a lot about this piece as well, um, but it's just really connecting to my love of drawing, um, my playfulness in sort of putting elements together. Um, so yeah. Is it? <laughs> Thank you. Mahalo, Gerald. It's it's so awesome. So awesome. Uh, okay. Okay, Mr. Kakaio. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Mm hmm Good. Uh yeah, on the white Kako. Um my name is Kaka Iwo Ravenscraft, um, and uh, yeah, this this kind of um, the concept was kind of birthed um, down in Honau now, up in Honau now, Honau now, Moka. Um, you know, talking with um, with Mina and gathering some wood, and um, anyway, my thought process went back to uh, Ho'okena, and. Um, a couple of years ago, I acquired uh, one of these stone implements here, the koi, and I'll, I'll be talking about the koi. But I acquired one of these um, from one of the aunties that I worked with, and she was out walking, 
and um, just happened it happened to catch your eye something odd about this stone there's the straight edge to it so she pulled it out of the stone and um, she pulled the stone out of the sand and um, behold it was a, a 10 inch um, ads a d z e i would be the one that has to say this word over the internet on a, on a over the webcam a d z e that's the ads koi uh, in hawaiian Anyway, it's an old tool, it was an artifact, and she pulled it out of the sand. Um, anyway, we say, Eia ke koi, behold the ads. The ads is, um, the ads is really a symbol, yeah? It's a symbol of a people. It's a symbol for Kanaka Maoli. Um, the ads is the tool which created uh, this nation that is Kanaka Maoli. When I say Kanaka Maoli, that's all the oceanic um, peoples, from Hawaii, all the way down south to uh, the land of the long white cloud, to the east, Rapa Nui, off the coast of Chile, and um, all of the central Pacific, um, Samoa, Tokelau, Tahiti, Nukuhiva, all those places. Yeah. Oceanic peoples, all the way back to Papua New Guinea. The ads was really the tool that brought us where we are. Yeah, from the ads, was born the canoe, yeah, which brought us across the ocean. Uh, from the ads is born the hale, the halau. Uh, these are the, the shelters, the structures we use um, to protect ourselves. Uh, from the ads comes the ki'i. Ki'i is the face of the almakua, the divine expression of our people. Um, so these ko'i are really, yeah, to me, they're, they're a symbol of, of who we are as a people, who we came from. The first person to create the ads was called Kupai Ke. And this is an ancient name and it's a reoccurring name. It comes up throughout our legends. Anyway, Kupai Ke was the first person to adapt um, the ads and to make it usable for building the first canoes. Um, anyway, so this, this collection of um, Ko'i, this collection of ads um, has been housed down at um, Pu'uhonua Ohonao Nau uh, National Historical Park. Um, so that's why I'm appearing in, in front of you all official looking uh, with the world's biggest hat on my head. Um, but yeah, that's because our um, down at the park, we've, um, yeah, we've, we've presented, uh, we've re refinished, restored uh, these adzes and uh, presented them uh, for you folks as our offering to this exhibit. Um, the largest of the ads on the far end, you can see the picture now, that's the ko'i that came to us from uh, Ho'okena. Um, the handle that it's sitting on is um, guava. And that was from one of the ads is that um, Papa Mao uh, Pi Lug used when he was building the canoe Mao Loa down there. So an ancient tool, an artifact attached to a kind of a modern artifact was used a couple of decades ago anyway has been repurposed the next one is another um stone koi that one is from uncle tava to Oku, another uh, carver canoe builder from uh, marquesas Nukuhiva. so that's one of his old broken ads and i cleaned up the edge i reattached it to its old handle the next one is of the kupai ke'e style it's an ads that's um, attached on a swivel. So you can, this is really good for um, building the va'a. When you carve out the gunnel, you can adjust the blade on the ads. So you can get, uh, normally you get a horizontal cut, you can adjust so you can get a vertical cut, a diagonal cut. Um, that's the kupai ke'e ads. Those three are kani ala, the black stone of uh, Mauna Kea. That is kani, the creative one. Uh, the next ads is, um, actually a wooden ads attached to a broken handle. Um, anyway, I just like the way that one looked. So I did that. Um, the wooden ads on that one, that's the Kawila wood, actually can be used for cutting, for finishing. Um, so the ads, traditionally, the black stone is Kane, the divine masculine. The, um, the handle is Haumea made from the hau tree. Haumea is the, um, 
divine feminine, the primal mother. Um, and they're bound together by their child, Ku, Ku Kaula. Ku is um, that force that drives man to achieve. Um, Ku is anything that can bind or fasten, uh, that can be steadfast. So the rope um, is made from the coconut. The coconut is a symbol of Ku. So that's the husk of the coconut. Um, these ropes were all not, not twisted by my hands, but made down on the island of Satawa, uh, which is in um, the Federated States of Micronesia. And then there's two others sticking out on the end. Um, they kind of look like red-headed stepchildren. Um, those are the ko'ihau, ko'ihau or the metal ads. Um, these were made, um, shouldn't call them stepchildren actually, they're quite handy. These are the ads that we predominantly use in our practice today. The stone ads, um, sometimes it makes cuts, but those are for the special cuts. So predominantly in our work, um, in the carving we do, we use the ko'ihau, the metal ads. These two particular ones were made by a blacksmith in um, uh, the, the Washington state. Um, anyway, yeah, this is kind of what we put together. Um, again, it's um, this ads, we, I feel, we believe is, is the symbol um, of our people, of Kanaka Maoli. It's the tool that brought us uh, where we are today. That's all I have. Mahalo. Wow. Mahalo. Thank you so much. There's so much mana. Oh. Okay. I know it's getting kind of late, but we got some more mana coming. Laurel, thank you so much. There we go. Oh, I got myself unmuted. Um, so this piece um, sort of began with a desire to explore um, the, the sort of the, the pig on the big island or the, the wild boar. Um, and I guess here, it, the wild boar plays such a huge role in Hawaiian culture, you know, whether it's the canoe pig that, you know, came over with the breadfruit and um, the papaya and taro and everything else, or um, whether it's Captain Vancouver's, um, you know, uh, wild European boar that came over um, or hunter's boar you know, this sort of, there are a lot of hunters for whom this is a way to feed their families or a rite of passage or a way of collecting trophies. Um, and uh, the pigs are also, you know, they're sort of this, they're a beast in the garden. They're, um, I mean, because they're so, you know, like Kamapua'a, he was always going after the girls. They're very, very prolific. And um, now they're around in numbers that are sort of out of balance. And, and um, so it's, I guess I made this piece as a way to kind of think about that. I don't really have any, um, you know, it's, it's a huge question. It's not my place. Um, but I, I like to think about things this way. And I picked, you know, I used color to sort of think about the different pigs. And I'm not going to tell you which is which because I think I might have my ideas, but I'd rather that you have your own ideas. Um, and of course, so these are, um, they're cast in um, lead crystal, which is um, a very heavy glass. So if you pick these up, they're, they're quite hefty. And Mina can testify to this. Um, uh, and I wanted to, I, I have been, I've had a pig job for about two years that someone gave me because I wanted to cast one in, um, glass. And on one hand, glass is this sort of, it's this, um, ubiquitous thing. We're all looking through windows and driving around in cars, but it's also, um, you know, with lead crystal, it's this sort of, uh, you know, it's very, it's for the fancy table. I, it, I sort of feel like I made these with a sort of veneration. Um, and 
but there's also using glass, there's this idea of, I don't know if, if you're familiar with it, the idea of, of boxers with glass jaws. So it's this kind of, um, it's this sort of frailty. Um, and I feel like, you know, the environment here is it's, you know, it has to be rebalanced. It's out of balance. And um, yeah, so that's what I was thinking about um, when I did these. I have to thank Mina. Um, we had a bunch of great, uh, or a few great conversations about Kamapua'a and she loaned me a book about him. And, you know, who cannot be in love with the, you know, the the handsome foreigner with the sparkling eyes. Um, uh, yeah, so it's something I, I'm just uh, trying to understand. And that's it, I'd love any questions you have. Wow, thank you, Laurel, so much. It was such a pleasure to learn more about your process and to see you persevere through all of the challenges of making these, it really is to me such a feat and and I have a special connection with with Pua'a myself as you know having a, a a pet one but um I think you've cat captured so much of the personality um of of the Pua'a of such a special animal here um that it 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 is balance it is a balance that we we need to strive for so um it just turned out beautifully I know you you want to keep working your technique and and you know getting it to a level that you see fit but it's beautiful and and if i had a ton of money i'd ask you to make me a chandelier so <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, well okay. when you when you win the lottery let me know and i'll do it <laughs> oh it's just incredible and she has been so patient i'm gonna turn it for, to uh, Hannah. Hannah, thank you so much, Laurel. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Aloha, Kako. Um, I'm Aloha. Hannah. <laughs> First stop, thank you so much to Mina for um, inviting me to be a part of this show with all of you. Um, it was really exciting. This is actually the first show on Hawaii Island I've been in. So yeah, <laughs> I just, you know, exported all to Oahu a lot, but I was so happy to finally have the opportunity to show here at home. So um, again, my name is Hana. Um, I was born on Hawaii Island in the 90s, but my Ohana moved away to the mainland for the bulk of my childhood and time growing up. Um, and then I moved back during college um, to Oahu first, um, UH Manoa, and then eventually back here. Um, so the last few years for me have really been about like reconnecting to this Aina in particular and kind of just, you know, strengthening that bond of this place that birthed me. So um, my painting practice begins with collecting ocean water and that becomes mixed with my pigments and ultimately it defines the painting. So for me, it's a really place-based way of working and you can look at the piece and hopefully you guys have had a chance to, or will have a chance to see it up close and all of the textures and things that happen, those are formed by the ocean. So that's something that's really exciting for me um, is I never know quite how they're gonna look. It's always a surprise. I call it a collaboration, um, you know, with the Kai, with Kanaloa to kind of form these pieces. So um, making, um, these pieces, or this one in particular, was just really special to be able to um, use it as a way to further process and reconnect to this place in particular. One of the main inspirations for my work is um, traditional Polynesian canoe voyaging and navigation. That stems from my experiences voyaging with Kanu Pokula'a and Hikianalia um, with the Polynesian Voyaging Society. I've been doing that for about six or seven years now. And it really just um, 
kind of permeates all of my art practice now and feeds into so much inspiration. Um, this piece in particular was poured with deep sea water from the equator, which we call Kapiko Wakea, and that was gathered during the um, final homecoming leg of Hokulea's worldwide voyage in 2017. So I always love um, the opportunity to take that water and try to create a conduit or this opportunity for people back home or people anywhere to experience hopefully that energy of that realm that maybe, you know, they'll never get to be there themselves. I want to try and bring it here or maybe it will inspire them and call to them and they'll end up on the va'a and they'll go out and experience it themselves. But um, in addition to the equator water, I also use water from Keoho Bay. Um, I mostly chose Keoho because this is the area I live in now and I'm in the ocean a lot down there and also because there's upland ties that kind of relate back to the va'a so in the 90s as well Ohana va'a or canoe community um, started planting a grove of koa up in Keoho Malka and um, we're still taking care of it and you know keeping up with it nowadays it's um it's growing um it's not quite big enough to build a whole va'a out of that's the hope that someday these um trees will become big enough to be canoe holes for future voyagers um some of our kupuna came up last year to check on them and they were hoping to make like a spa and like the main sail the piece of wood the sail goes on and they were almost there but not quite so they were going to use some from a different area but we keep watching them and they'll be there and it's really exciting to know that that's growing up there and that resource is going to replenish um, and that's kind of how we um, for everything that the community and the land of Kona gives to us in resources, hoping to try and give back and, you know, recip reciprocity, uh, return things to the land as well. So in addition to um, being tied materially to Keoho because of those reasons, this is also really inspired by Hokula'a's last visit to Hawaii Island in 2018. Um, that was a really exciting time for me to finally kind of get to be at home in Kona, but also have the va'a here and have the opportunity to help share it with the community. Um, it was really special and it um, was amazing just the amount of support from people that come down and give us um, not only their, you know, support emotionally and all these things, but they also just bring so many things from the land. So both here and anywhere in the world we go, especially in Polynesia or anywhere in Oceania, um, it's really special when people bring things that they've grown themselves. Um, so in Kona, you know, we get ulu, we get all the canoe plants that um, like Haida was talking about, people would bring those to us. They would bring coffee and cocoa and chocolate and just really everything. So it's super special to have um, people show up in those ways and bring us um, not only themselves, but also the connections and what they've grown here. Um, so it's really awesome being nourished in that way. Um, I think that's about it. I'm really glad I got to go last. Um, you guys shared so many awesome olelo is why, and it was just so cool to hear everything. And you brought up things that I just, you know, hadn't thought about to talk like Haida talking about the Va'a plants and um, I loved Njia sharing about um, especially the story of Hi'iaka um, that made me think so sometimes if we're on the Va'a and it's like bad weather and it can get kind of scary um, in those times when I'm not having to steer or do anything like that if it's my time to sleep I will think of that mo'olelo and I curl up and I pretend that I'm in an egg and it really helps me feel better. So it just all ties together and you guys brought in so many different viewpoints and stories that just 
made me go, wow, like that's Va'a too. Like all these things about land and all these different experiences, they also tie into the Va'a. And that's always really exciting for me to learn and see different ways those connections form. So thanks. Mahalo to you guys for all of your time and Mana'o. Oh, mahalo nui, Hana. That was, it's, it is, it, it's, it's so humbling and it's so beautiful. And um, like I was, I was mentioning with the places that you all went and exploring your own connection to this Aina and, and how it, how it shapes you is, um, you know, I think now as, as always, but now it is really um, grounding for us to think about and um, it, it can give us hope, you know, that this connection um, with our Aina, with the sea, with the land is, is connecting us with each other and, and, and our ancestors too, you know, wherever they were from. So, ooh, my heart is full. Does anybody else have any, anything they wanna share? This is great. Uh, for me, this is great. I mean, everybody, your personalities came out in, especially Zeth, this last picture I'm looking. I see so many faces in this one. Man, I get yeah. a chicken skin running through my legs right now. <laughs> and it's like, um, first thing, it's an embryo. It's an embryo. <laughs> the universe. Absolutely. You know, I saw that too, you know. I mean, it really is an embryo with the fish, you know, uh, and the eye. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating, this detail. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. Talk about chicken skin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, mahalo, everybody, for, for spending the evening with us and being so generous in your time and and um, and being so so generous with your sharing your mana'o and, and your knowledge as well. So, uh, Miho, did you have anything? Well, I was wondering... <laughs> First of all, yeah, definitely chicken skin. So many great stories. Um, it, it's so nice. I wish more people get to listen, but you know, be here. But I guess we're going to be sharing this. Um, I do. Want, I don't know, Mina, if you have docent tours scheduled um, for the future of this exhibition. But I thought it might be another opportunity where we can invite artists in person mm -hmm. to collaborate with you to tell some of the stories mm -hmm. during the span of this exhibition. And I, I do, if you haven't seen the show, you know, the photographs are beautiful, but it's nothing like seeing the pieces in person. So I would definitely um, stop by. Yeah. Yes. Mahalo everybody. Yeah, well, and um, yeah, I will be coordinating to, to film folks who wanna do a, a a short film, um, not short film, but you know, sh short video clip of, of uh, talking about their piece as well that we can share. Um, and we can talk to see who might wanna do, uh, uh, participate in a, in a tour, maybe a small, small group type thing. Yeah, uh oh, we're getting some chat. Okay. Yeah, I'm everyone for, for sharing, you know, your, um, pieces and talking more about them. I think just like I said before, I've been spending a lot of time with the show. So I've read all the artist statements and I just think it's a really um, phenomenal show. And I love hearing from everybody too. I think there's so much to learn and so much to absorb. I'm kind of like overwhelmed with all the information, but it's like all really awesome. So thank you. <laughs> I feel like we have to have a Namala part two and three, you know, like where does it go from here? You know, like what do we learn from each other and then where does the artwork expand into, you know? Like, right. So go, yeah. How do we yeah. evolve our yeah. system to be more sustainable? Yeah. Yeah. And so no, the conversation we have literal experts joining us next week. So I'm really looking forward to um to that discussion and and um, you know, using this all everything we talked about today as a foundation for a conversation next week. So yeah. Ooh. A springboard for change. Congratulations, yeah. Mina. That's 
a beautiful show. Aww. Aww. Thank Aww. you so much for your stories. Oh, mahalo everyone. Thank you for joining us and we will be in touch. Um, yeah, visit us on, on uh, Instagram and Facebook too. But mahalo everyone. Thank hey, you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mina. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing nice work. Thank you. Yes, Mahalo, Jesse. We'll see you soon. Aloha, Mahalo, everybody. So. Yeah.